Hello friends, how do I re-enchant my life? In today's video, I talk about practical solutions to this question as well as how we got here so that we can change our thinking and perception. Just want to give a caveat here at the beginning. A lot of what I say is going to be applicable in American culture, but it may not be applicable elsewhere. So apply as appropriate mutatis mutandis. So what's the problem? A lot of people these days feel that the world is kind of flat, that the unseen spiritual dimension is just sort of not accessible. Like, I believe in it. I believe in angels. I believe in demons. I believe in spirits. I believe in unseen forces. But where are they? Where are they? This is a very common problem now. And one way for us to begin to access this is actually a reality that we all know on one level or another. And that is, we know demons. We have a sense that there is evil in the world and maybe in my life that I cannot explain, right? That it's not just the result of one person gone bad or whatever. There's some kind of spiritual forces at play that I can't quite put my finger on. So we do already have some sense of the enchanted world, even though it's pretty dark and pretty bad. So what are the causes of this? Well, there's a lot of things that we could talk about. Uh, it's been a long cultural road to this point, but I just want to touch on a few that probably make sense to us here in the 21st century. The first is the break with nature, right? Human beings now spend less time outside, outside of, of walls, outside of buildings, than we probably ever have at any point in history. There's just a lot of stuff to do, right? Uh, kids, you got a lot of entertainment going on inside. Adults have a lot of entertainment going on inside. And so because we have all this entertainment available to us, we don't tend to go outside as much as our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents used to. It's just much easier to access all this other stuff. So we just do most of the time. We have to make a deliberate choice to go outside. And so because we're inside so much, now we have the, the, um, the problem of being terminally online, as they sometimes say, spending a lot of time on the internet just endlessly, endlessly for hours on end, always going back, always checking our phones, right? We rarely do what now people say, touch grass. I love that expression, touch grass, which means go outside, right? But we spend all this time in our homes, disconnected from the natural world, right? And then what do we connect with when we're, when we're in here? Well, as I said, there's lots of entertainment, but one of the things that we often connect with is bad news. Bad news all the time, actually. We have access to more bad news than probably any generation before us. And it's available constantly, constantly, right? Not just bad news in the news, but also sort of general doom scrolling where we see difficult things, stressful things, traumatic things all the time. And this has the effect of deadening our senses, including our spiritual senses. So this world gets flatter as a result. Right. There's other things that play into this as well, like our, our, our architecture. Right. I, you might not think about that right away, but think about the way that architecture in the modern world tends to go. Uh, it tends to be very blocky and not very beautiful. And even where it is attempting to be beautiful, it's not very ornate. It's very, very functional much of the time. If you look at really old buildings, buildings are 100 years old or more, um, you'll probably notice that even the simplest of them, tended to have certain flourishes, certain uh, things that, that said this is an important building in some way, even if it was a relatively unimportant, unimportant building, right? You know, brickwork or sculptures or whatever that gave it something extra because the people of that time believed that it was worth it to spend that extra time, money, and effort on architecture that accentuated human life and didn't simply serve its functional purposes. So we're surrounded by bad architecture. And then connected to that also is that in our, in our public culture, the stuff that's built, instead of monuments being quite as prominent, now we have advertisements. There are still monuments, but advertisements are way, way more available to us. And even when we do put up public sculpture, let's face it, a lot of that public sculpture, in cities especially, is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It's almost impossible to connect to. It's very abstract, very 
weird, right? Oh, it's, it's, it's not human. It's not humane anymore. And so this contributes to a certain sense of disenchantment. It's just sort of geometric or, or whatever else it might be. There's also a lot of bad theology out there. And uh, this could probably be hours of discussion, but I just kind of want to outline. We generally went as Christians from having kind of three spiritual levels, as it were. You've got God, you've got spirits, angels, demons, whatever, and humans. And always, always these three interacting with each other all the time. And then eventually what happens is, especially with the Reformation, where Protestantism doesn't want you to venerate saints, doesn't want you to talk to angels, doesn't want you to call upon them for help. It gets flattened to just two level, God and us. And that's why so many people say, well, I can just connect to God directly, uh, which has always been true. But what they mean by that is, let's push all those other spirits out. And so it flattened it to just two levels. And then, of course, now you get to the point of secularism, and it's flattened to just one. It's just us. It's not us and the saints and angels and God. It, and it's not us and God. It's, it's just us, right? And so this unseen dimension now is being actively denied as even existing at all. And so then, as a result of that, we get all kinds of really bad theology that goes along with it. Even where we do believe that God is, is still there uh, because of this other spiritual dimension kind of being gone, we tend to think of our lives in very Gnostic terms, right? So the end of my life, it's about my soul escaping my body so I can go to heaven when I die. End of story. End of story. And yet Christianity actually talks about resurrection of the body. Resurrection of the body. And that means that the spiritual dimension, the material dimension, the unseen dimension, the seen dimension, always, always together in traditional Christian theology. But in our flattened world, the resurrection doesn't really come up that much, does it? So a lot of bad theology out there. But also another thing that feeds into the sense of disenchantment is a loss of ritual. Pre-modern societies filled with ritual, not just in like what we might think of as religious services, but in everything, in public life, there's all, all kinds of rituals. And now we just have a few left, right? We do a ritual when we inaugurate a president, although honestly, it, it's not much of a ritual. It, it really should be longer. <laughs> We do rituals when we graduate people. Again, though, like it's not really that much of an initiation of trying to push the graduates along as fast as possible. About the only place where people continue to have elaborate ritual regularly in our society is weddings. But even then, it's not really required. You can go down to the justice of the peace. Do you? Do you? I do. I do. Sign right here. Boom, you're married. Right? Not a lot of ritual. Ritual has always been one of the ways that human beings interact with the unseen world. And so we have less of it. I'm not saying we have none, we have less of it than that sense of interaction, the sense of the presence of the unseen world. It's less, it's disenchanted. And a lot of what this boils down to, frankly, is individualism, right? The focus being on me. And you can see this in Christianity too. Christians will say, me and God, just me and God, right? This is again, you know, you're pushing those saints and angels out of the way, just me and God. And I don't need anybody else either. Like, I don't need a priest. I don't need a pastor. Just me and God. It's individualistic. And indeed, our societies are built on the idea of individual rights. Now, I'm not saying I'm against human beings treated with dignity and respect and honor and, and so forth. But you should notice that individualism is the thing that kind of rules the way that we think about ourselves. And individualism, where you've got me and my soul and who I really am and who I am deep inside, and, and I've got to find the real me, I've got to discover myself, notice that it's me, 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 I, I, my, 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 the whole time. And when do I have time for an unseen world? When do I have time to realize that I live in a spiritual neighborhood with neighbors in it? Right. So this is these are kind of the causes that I mean, there's a lot of other things we could talk about, but those are sort of the main the main causes for our sense of disenchantment in the world. So we want to re-enchant our experience. Um, we should ask, though, what exactly is the goal of doing that? Um, it is not from an Orthodox Christian point of view. It is not so that we can see visions. Right. It is not so that we can learn esoteric secrets, right? That is not the point at all. I know that some people probably desire that. I understand that. And um, people who desire that sometimes can go down the road of what I call dark re-enchantment, 
which is real re-enchantment for sure, but it's bad. It's harmful because the enchanted experience is not necessarily a good experience because the spiritual world is very real, but there are spirits that want uh, what is good for you, and there are spirits that do not want what is good for you. They want to harm you, right? So just because something is re-enchanting doesn't mean that it's good. Just because something gets you in touch with the spiritual world doesn't mean that it's good. And there's different ways that people attempt to do this, engage in dark re-enchantment. One is that they like to do hallucinogenic drugs. Don't do drugs. It opens you up to a spiritual world for sure. But do you really know what you're doing there? Do you really know what you're going to do if you encounter some spirit that is way more powerful and experienced and brilliant and smart than you? Because you probably will. Are you sure that's a good idea? You know, you can you can open the door to that world and it's real, but it's not necessarily good for you. So don't do drugs. Also, and this is probably even more obvious, don't do the occult. Not because it's fake and doesn't work, because it's real and it does work, right? The occult is all about trying to control uh, people, events, objects through kind of spiritual technology. And it works. It does enchant your world, but again, it's dark, it's evil, it's bad for you, harms you, harms other people, don't do the occult. And this may be a little bit less obvious, but there's also kind of enchantment that people engage in when they engage in political idolatry, right? You're seeking re-enchantment, you're seeking to have your world not be so flat, you want it to be filled with meaning, filled with spiritual power, people can become politically idolatrous. This candidate, this movement, this ideology, Whatever it is, this is going to save the world. A lot of messianic language going along with that. Uh, a lot of messianic imagery attached to whoever your, your favorite politician or wh whatever is. Um, you know, people engage in rituals. They have ritual clothing. They have ritual slogans. You know, all this kind of stuff is engaged in political idolatry. Again, another form of dark re-enchantment. It is enchantment. Absolutely, for sure. It absolutely is but it's dark re-enchantment. So that's not what we're trying to do. Just because you can re-enchant doesn't mean that it's good. We want the good kind, okay? So what is the goal of seeking re-enchantment? The goal, frankly, for an Orthodox Christian is to be saved. The goal is to be saved. And to be saved in the Orthodox Church is to become like Christ. That's what it means. It's not just about where you go when you die. I mean, that's actually just one stage. There are more stages past that. Remember the resurrection? That's not all there is to it. You know, it's just what happens to you when you die. Uh, the goal is to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from demons, saved from sin, saved from death. That's what it means to be saved, to become like Christ, to become, as the Lord says, equal to the angels. That's what salvation is. Now, can you be saved without focusing on re-enchantment? The answer is, yes, you can. People have done it for centuries upon centuries. Now, former generations, especially multiple centuries back, probably didn't think too much about this because they didn't live in a disenchanted experience. We do. We do. And because we do, that makes it harder for us to engage with the unseen world. But you do not need to self-consciously try to do this in order to be saved. It's not required. So if you don't need this, great, you know. <laughs> Don't even, don't worry about it. It's not absolutely necessary. If this helps you be saved, then go for it. If it helps you become more faithful, then go for it. And that's the point of what I'm talking about today, is it's to try to make it a little bit easier to be faithful to Christ so that you can be obedient to him, so that you can repent, so that when he judges you according to what you have done at the end of, the, end of time, that you will be found to be like him, that you will be saved, that you will be elevated, exalted to be equal to the angels. Okay, now we get to the actual how-to part of this discussion. There's a lot of things I'm going to say. This is not exhaustive. Um, probably you can think of some more. You know, Put them in the comments uh, if you'd like to know some more, if you'd like to offer some suggestions about this. But here are my suggestions. Number one, more than anything else, you've got to become serious about prayer and fasting and almsgiving. These are the three basic, central kind of workhorse actions of our salvation. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. 
When I talk about prayer, I don't just mean private prayer at home. I also mean corporate prayer in church, praying with other Christians in the church, engaging in those services. Why? Why is that so important to do that? It's because especially the sacraments, but all the services, um, you know, when incense is offered, these actually do something to you in an unseen way, generally speaking, when you're actually there. Reading about it is nice but you got to show up and do it. And the same goes true, same is true for your private prayer as well, right? So, so publicly, corporately, we celebrate the feasts of the church. Don't skip the feasts, people. Don't skip the feasts. They tell these awesome, amazing stories. You got to be there so you can participate in the story yourself. And, and uh, you got to venerate the saints, get to know them. You know, this is all part of that corporate prayer. Show up for that, show up. But also private prayer, you got to show up for that too. Get up in the morning, do that morning prayer. Before you go to sleep at night, do that evening prayer. Before and after, God willing, you eat, do those prayers, right? Ask for God's blessing all the time. Where is God? Why doesn't he seem to be showing up? How often do you actually invite him? How often do you invite him? Not very much, probably, if you're like me, right? So we got to be serious about private and corporate prayer. And the movements that we engage in, the actual physical actions that we engage in, in both of those settings of prayer, change who we are, connect us in a good, healthy way with the unseen spiritual world. You got to actually do the stuff. You can't just think about it and talk about it, read about it, argue about it on the internet. You got to do the stuff, right? Okay, so that's prayer. I mentioned fasting, but it's not just fasting, it's asceticism in general. Why is asceticism so important? It's because it is a spiritual action in the physical body. Okay, uh, spiritual action in the physical body. If you are weighed down by the lusts of the flesh, you know you know what they are, right? If you're weighed down by that stuff, your ability to engage in the spiritual life in any good, healthy way, it's going to be very, very hampered. Very, very hampered. You have to always be working on that purification. If you're not working on it, then it's just an intellectual game, guys. It's just like a game. You got to actually do the stuff and asceticism. You know, the, the, the fasting, the, uh, uh, the, the long church services, frankly, chastity, appropriate, appropriately done within marriage and, and ex, you know, done constantly outside of marriage, right? All of these things are really part of, of, of what it means to actually be engaged in the spiritual world well, right? So if you're, if you're fat and satisfied on your desires, it's going to be really hard really hard to engage with the spiritual world. Doesn't mean that you have to be a certain weight or <laughs> that's not what I mean at all. I mean that you're engaging in the struggle. Are you engaging in the struggle? The struggle happens in this physical body. The physical body really, really matters. We're not Gnostics. You know, you are your body. It's not just some kind of shell. So I mentioned prayer, mentioned asceticism, fasting, all those kinds of asceticism, and then also almsgiving. Almsgiving is not only to give money to those who are in need, it is to give kindness, it is to give uh, care, all of that stuff. It is to be selfless, frankly. It is to sacrifice yourself for other people. If you're not doing that, if you're not engaging in active love, again, it's going to be very, very difficult to engage with the spiritual world in any proper way. Be very, very difficult. So you got to do those things. Prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Just this is baseline stuff. If you're not doing that stuff, the rest of theology, the rest of whatever, forget it. Forget it. I mean, some of the saints have said exactly this. St. Athanasius the Great, in one of his, his writings, he said, unless you're actually imitating the lives of the saints, you'll never understand their teachings. So it's, it's absolutely critical. What you do, the way you participate, makes a difference. Okay, here's another thing you can do. You gotta change your environment if you want to have a sense of the enchantment of the world. You wanna re-enchant your experience of the world. One of the most important things you could do is go outside. I mentioned that at the beginning, go outside. Go outside, spend time in the natural world, go on long walks, especially away from buildings and stuff. So like out in the woods, out on the beach. I mean, whatever it is you can do. Everybody can, if you can walk, you can take walks. If you can't walk, figure out something else you can do, but spend some time in the natural world. Spend a lot more time in the natural world. I think one of the reasons that we have this sense of disconnection with the unseen world is we're actually not engaging with the seen world that God made. 
right? He filled it with his spiritual power. And if we're always hiding from it inside our buildings, then we're, we're not connecting with it. So, uh, but you can also, not just taking long walks and kind of getting out in nature, you can also do things to shape your, your direct environment, spend time outside yourself. So gardening, if you're able to do some gardening, whether it's like you can actually have a whole garden or maybe just some plants and pots, whatever it might be, plant some trees, take care of trees, take care of trees for years, right? This is something that I do. I'm, I'm not claiming to be good at it. I'm, I'm not good at it, but I, we have gotten some fruit, thank God. Um, you know, also shape your home, like make it beautiful, like work. Maybe you're not an architecture architect or you're not a, a builder or whatever, fine. But beautify your home, especially on the outside. It says something to the world, says something to you. This helps to re-enchant your experience with the world. Okay, so there's some other things you can do also to shape your environment that you're in. Uh, icons. Eh, this might seem obvious, but, but icons. Make sure you have a prominent prayer corner in your home. And if you have the ability, um, another one maybe in your bedroom, another one in your office, like wherever you're able to do that. I know not everybody's able to do that everywhere. But you should have at least one place, which is the place you go to, to pray. And should be adorned with icons, cross, whatever it is that you can afford. But don't just fill it up with lots of stuff. Make those icons ones that are specifically meaningful to you. Saints that you know, feasts that you really connect with, and obviously more than anything else, Christ, his mother, right? Icons, it really does help to re-enchant the world, not just because we see them on our walls and pray in front of them, but also because of the stories that they tell. Human beings are visual animals, and icons tell us stories, and they reveal to us the actual enchantment in the world by what it is that they show. They're, they're showing the spiritual reality right there in front of us. So icons, I mean, engage with them, use them, okay? Spend as much time as you can inside Orthodox church buildings. Even the simplest ones are designed, even like the simplest ones, like where some storefront that's been converted a little bit or whatever it might be, to the most glorious, incredible, massive cathedral, uh, they are all designed to reveal the spiritual world to us in one way or another. So spend time inside those buildings as much as you can. Another one you may not think about too much is pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage changes your setting. It makes your life changed for a while. Uh, and you're going to venerate some holy person, place, object, whatever it might be. You're going on a journey of prayer. Pilgrimage takes you outside of the routines of your life and puts you on a journey that is specifically a spiritual journey. And that's going to change your perception. It's going to change who you are. It's going to change your thinking. I really recommend pilgrimage uh, if you're able to do it. Not everybody's able, I understand that. But if you're able to do it, make those pilgrimages. And uh, if you can make a long pilgrimage, that's great, where it really kind of takes you outside of what you're used to. Uh, the reality is, of course, pilgrimage includes going to church. It includes going to your icon corner. I'm not saying that those experiences are all exactly the same, but there's something similar going on where you take the journey. It's a spiritual journey. You're going somewhere for a spiritual purpose. And that's the essence of what pilgrimage is, that veneration where you go to venerate, right? And so that's how we go to monasteries, to holy relics, to holy places. Um, and if you're able, you know, I, I've been very blessed to go on some pilgrimages overseas. And, and every time I come back, a different person with a stronger sense of spiritual reality in the world. So take those pilgrimages. Um, another thing, this might not be obvious, let me suggest you go to used bookstores. Bookstores are good. Used bookstores in some ways are better. Why? You kind of never know what you're going to encounter there. So it makes you more open, right? Which is a really important thing when you're trying to re-enchant your world. It makes you more open. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're more likely to explore a used bookstore. And I think exploration is a really important virtue when it comes to seeking out re-enchantment, right? So... Just give a little plug for used bookstores, right? Okay, another thing that's really important to do if you're seeking for re-enchantment in your life is be way more social, people. <laughs> be way, way more social. It, it is a reality of the modern world that people spend less time with their family, less time with their friends. They're, they're joining things, clubs, churches, organizations, volunteer groups. They're joining that stuff way less. Like a lot of, a lot of 
groups and organizations and so forth and churches are dying just because people don't go anymore. They just don't go. And it, a lot of it's connected back to us staying inside and being constantly entertained. Let's face it, right? It's just easier. I don't have to deal with other people. I understand that that is the case for a lot of people a lot of the time. And a lot of the work I do, I deal with a lot of people, but there are definitely there are three or four times I don't want to deal with people. But when you make that a kind of way of life, when you make it a personality, when you make it an identity, like, oh, I just, you know, I don't want to, then you are cutting yourself off from the enchantment of being with other humans. You can't get that through the internet. You can't get it any other way. You have to be with other humans. So show up. And because this is hard for us now, I think it's really important to ritualize it. Number one, simply have a ritual of maybe a schedule. So like maybe there's a group of friends, you have dinner once a month. Um, obviously church, it's, it's built right in, right? You, it's ritualized by definition. You show up at a particular time, you do particular things, um, you know, r- ritualize it because that ritualization helps to ingrain the habit within us, but it also is part of what it means to interact with the unseen world, okay? Um, so to spend that time with your family, spend that time with your friends and volunteer, join a group of some kind something that interests you if you're able, something where you're doing something good, whatever it might be, spend time on a regular basis with other humans. Get outside of yourself. Because remember, the opposite of enchantment is individualism. That's the opposite of enchantment is individualism. And so if you're going to be cured of individualism, you're going to have to connect with, with other human beings. Another significant thing that you can do is to learn to reinterpret the scriptures and life in a way that engages with the unseen world much better. So number one, most important, church services. You go to Orthodox church services, listen very closely, try to understand what's going on, engage, ask questions when the service is over or beforehand of someone who knows, someone who understands, so you can know what it is that is happening in the service. What does it do to you when you are there? What is the story that is being told? right? Church services help us to reinterpret the world. They help us to understand the scriptures in a way that engages with the unseen world in a good, healthy, beautiful way. You can't, again, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. You cannot do without it, right? So go to church services, listen very closely. Another thing you can do is to read the lives of saints. I know you hear this recommendation from every Orthodox person probably who talks about anything, but it's actually a really good one. Because you can see in those stories how the saints themselves engage with the unseen world, how they understand what's going on. And it shows you what's really there. It pulls back the veil so you can actually see it. It's not just talk about the experiences the saints have, but actually see those experiences in the saints' lives. And you know what? There is a gazillion collections of saints' lives out there. Pick saints uh, that you're named after. Pick saints that uh, are local to you if you've got saints local to you. Pick saints that are from an area that maybe your ancestors were from. It doesn't really matter. Just read those saints' lives. Read them for yourself. Read them out loud to your kids. Really, really important for beginning to understand, see the world in this healthy, enchanted way. Connected with that, a lesser version of that, but also I think very important in our time, is to spend time reading fairy tales, mythology, legends, right? These things are not just for kids. I think one of of my favorite quotes, I think this is from C.S. Lewis, is where he says, someday perhaps you will be old enough again to read fairy tales. (laughs) I'm sure I'm getting it a little bit wrong. But that's the point, right? Fairy tales are not just for kids. They're actually really for adults. And and indeed, the idea that there was literature just for kids is is sort of a recent kind of idea. It's okay, you know, it's fine. I'm, I'm not against children's literature. But fairy tales is not children's literature. It's human literature, okay? Fairy tales mythology, legends, Um, some suggestions that I would have from my own experience, classical mythology, right? So Iliad, Odyssey, the Aeneid, those are the big, big, big ones, but there's lots of other stuff there too, of course, other poetry and plays. Uh, Arthurian legends, that is a huge, huge, huge collection of stuff. 
it's so great. And it's actually has a lot of Christian layers in it too. One that I'm starting to get to know a little bit uh, lately, especially is, is Welsh mythology and legends, which actually overlaps a little bit with that uh, Arthur stuff. You can read the Mabinogion. That's a collection of Welsh mythology. You can read the Taliesin. That's a collection of poetry that's related to that stuff. I'm a big fan of Beowulf, as you probably know, uh, old English epic. You know, there's some very good translations out there. So find, find a good one for that. The Volsunga saga, that's a major, major Norse saga. Again, there's a lot of good translations for that out there. You can read the Eddas, also Norse material, particularly the prose Edda is probably a little bit easier than the, than the poetic Edda. Good old Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, you can't, you can't go wrong there and get the good kind, right? Not the kind of watered down variety, get the good kind, the Grimm's fairy tales, but whatever else. Okay. Now, I mean, I mentioned these, these are things that are, that are probably going to connect with people, at least in my culture, probably heard, heard of some of these things before, but I'm just mostly speaking about what I know. So there's a whole world of myth and legend all over, you know, don't, don't hold back. Right. So don't, don't feel like you're limited to the things that I mentioned, right. Check that stuff out. It helps you to see the world in a powerfully enchanted spiritual way right? Even though it's mostly fiction in one way or another, that's not the point. It shapes your imagination. It shapes your understanding, shapes your perception. Also, a little bit less important than even that, I suggest reading some good modern fantasy. As you can guess, I recommend Tolkien very much. Uh, C.S. Lewis also wrote some good stuff. Lloyd Alexander, The the Chronicles of, of Predine, um, George MacDonald. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good examples uh, that I could give and uh, maybe you can give some, so put those down in the comments if you want to give some good examples of modern fantasy, not just books that are fun or that you like to read or whatever, but stuff that actually has this imagination-shaping, perception-shaping character to it that helps you see the world for what it really is, right? Look at the spiritual unseen dimension. Um, finally, I'll recommend you know checking out some, some good online media that are related to this question. There's not a huge amount out there. There is some. Of course, I'm going to recommend to you that you check out the Lord of Spirits podcast because that's pretty much what the show is about. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great show, in my opinion, not because I'm on it, but because largely because of my, my co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung. You know, I'm interacting with what he's doing, making some of my own contributions. But I, I really recommend that, especially if you want to understand how to read the scriptures in this way. I think it's it's really important that we understand the scriptures with all of their dimensions. Of course, probably many of you are fans of Jonathan Pajot's The Symbolic World. That's dealing with a lot of the stuff from another angle. Um, also really, really helpful for a lot of people in terms of re-enchanting the world. One you might not expect, I'm a big fan of the Fall of Civilizations podcast. Uh, it talks about, it, well, it does what it says on the label, but it really engages with the spiritual element of what's going on there. Uh, I don't know whether the host himself believes in, in that spiritual element, that that's actually true, but he describes what these people believed and why it drove what they did, right? So that's really important. And it gives you this huge, massive scope. I mean, the average episode is like three to four hours long. I like long podcasts. What can I say? Uh, I also recommend uh, another one of my podcasts, Elman Sewell, which is a Tolkien podcast. It's about discussing it from an Orthodox Christian point of view. Pretty soon I'm going to be handing that podcast over to a friend of mine, Father Anthony Cook. It's going to continue doing the same kind of thing. A lot of people have recommended to me writing by Martin Shaw and Paul Kingsnorth along these lines as well. I'm not quite as familiar with their work, but a lot of people that I respect really do recommend it in terms of trying to re-enchant our world in a good, healthy way. Again, healthy is so, so important. Okay, just to wrap things up, what is it that this is about? It's about curing individualism. There's something much bigger than me. The world is much bigger than I am, right? It, that's so important for us to, to really get that down deep in our bones. And the reason why the world seems so flat and unenchanted, disenchanted, is because we're individualists and we're not used to looking outside of ourselves. So cure that individualism. Remember the goal. The goal is not enchantment. The goal is not to see visions, to dream dreams, to ha have esoteric knowledge. The goal is definitely not to assert some kind of spiritual control over other people or objects or the world or whatever. That is not the goal. The goal is to be saved. The goal is to be saved. The goal is to become 
more like Christ. Again, if you don't need any of this in order to be faithful to Christ, then ignore everything I just said. Do the good things that you know to do, the good things that you're already doing, right? But remember the goal. The goal is salvation, not just better perception or whatever it might be. What are some likely results if we actually pursue this and do the things that I talked about? Well, God willing, there's going to be more faithfulness, right? If I understand and see the world and, and, and at, least am able, at least am able to interpret the world as it truly is, then I'm going to be motivated to be more faithful. I'm going to be motivated to do all those things that are the things that the good and faithful Christian does, right? And honestly, it's probably going to lower my stress level. If I see the world as it truly is, even all of the horrifying, difficult things that are going on there, but I see the spiritual dimension more clearly, the unseen dimension more clearly, I know that God wins. Christ himself said, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. If you really know that, because you can see the spiritual dimension in the good, healthy, proper way, it's going to lower your stress level because... You don't have to be going crazy about even the actual, real, genuinely evil things that are going on in the world because you understand how God is using it. You understand how to help heal people in the midst of it. It's going to lower your stress level, very likely. You're also probably going to have better relationships because, number one, you're not going to be so self-centered, but you're going to also bring in the spiritual dimension to your relationships. This is really, really critical, especially for married people, but anyone who's in any kind of relationship of any kind, right? I'm not just talking about romantic relationships. Relationships of any kind. The closer you grow, grow to God, the more you engage in the kind of freedom that comes with a beautiful uh, contact, communication with the unseen world, your relationships are going to be better because you're not going to expect that one other person to be everything for you, number one. You're also going to come into it with a more mature, stable sensibility yourself. It's going to make your relationships better. And you will also have a greater sense of meaning and purpose in the world. You're going to see how the everyday moments of your regular old mundane life are actually kind of charged with spiritual power. You're going to see how the little acts of faithfulness that you do every day are steps on the journey to becoming equal to the angels, are steps on the journey to life in the kingdom with Christ. And you're living it now. It's not just in the future. It's also now, right? Why is it that so many saints are able to live such sort of boring to the world, boring lives? It's because they see what it is they're really working on. And they're endlessly fascinated. They're endlessly inspired. Even in those difficult moments, those moments of real struggle, those moments where they cry out to God and say, okay, how much longer, right? They still see the goal. And so therefore, there is a stronger sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. So that's what I have to say about this today. Do you have some suggestions of your own? Please leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear from you. And uh, thanks so much for listening. God bless you.